For those of you I haven't met, I'm Ronnie Stidman, the director of the Center for Politics and Governance at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And welcome to tonight's installment of our Page Turner series. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the center, we're fairly new, and we're the nexus of the theoretical and the practical in the teaching of politics and uh, political leadership. And to that end, what we try to do is teach our students how things are, how things really work, so that they can change them to be how they should be. And uh, as part of that, we have practitioners and authors come to offer their unique perspectives on their own experiences in the political arena. And so tonight, we're delighted to have as our Page Turner series installment, Nadine Eckhart and Sarah Eckhart. Uh, Nadine is going to read from her memoir, Duchess of Palms. And, uh, and then we're gonna have a conversation with the two of them uh, about the changing role of uh, women and their expanded opportunities uh, in the political arena. So we're thrilled. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about them. Uh, Nadine Eckhart, in her book, Duchess of Palms, tells a remarkable story of a 50s girl who lived through the men in her life, acclaimed political novelist Billy Lee Brammer and later US Congressman Bob Eckhart. Then over time, achieved success in her own right as a, as a restaurateur, assistant to Molly Ivins, and writer. Nadine Eckhart has worked in politics and journalism, lobbied, sold real estate, and run restaurants. Now retired in Austin, she continues to enjoy life as a writer, mother, and grandmother. And I hope you all have the opportunity to see um, Sunday's feature on her in The Statesman, which was wonderful. So if you haven't had an opportunity, I hope you will, will look at that. She will be joined tonight by her daughter, Travis County Commissioner and LBJ School alumna, Sarah Eckhart, who also uh, has worked previously, um, at, who's an attorney as well, as I understand, worked in the uh, uh, Travis County Attorney's Office, is that correct? Yes. And so we're delighted to have them both here. Um, one would be terrific, and two is extra special. So please join me in welcoming these remarkable women. Privy to the inner workings of the government's powerful political circles, 
how that circumstance has propelled me at Omni 24 to be photographed for the American, for the American Weekly, standing on the steps of the Capitol, surrounded by Lyndon Johnson, the powerful U.S. Majority Leader, and his wife. How had I ended up married to a man who would soon become one of the most well-known novelists in Texas? I could not have known then what a wild ride my life would turn out to be, that not only would I spend many years working in politics, but, but that later I would return to our nation's capital as the wife of a U.S. congressman. Looking back, it seems fantastic and strange, almost the stuff of fiction. Gil and I might have been more intimidated by D.C. and its trappings if we'd been less sophisticated young people. We were 24 and 26. Growing up on small town politics and bicultural South Texas, experiencing 1950s Austin and living my life on intuition, served me well with LBJ. I knew I didn't want to be obligated to this older man. He seemed old to me, even though he was only 47. Who yeah. <laughs> seemed to strike fear in everyone's hearts. If he came to the office and he saw a cluttered desk, the former school teacher in him verbally racked the knuckles of the whole office while making the offender into an object lesson. Why he blew up like that was unknown. I never felt uneasy around him, and I enjoyed him when he talked softly and instructively to me without any, without any sexual innuendo. <laughs> Senator Johnson's staff was terrific, a well-functioning public relations operation. It was considered the best on the hill. LBJ was his own best staff person, Piggy Virgo, with excellent insights and a hands-on, some said too hands-on, <laughs> man management style. He was involved in every aspect of his operation. For example, he had a rule that all mail must be answered before anyone went home at night. We would compose the, the replies, Johnson would read everything, noting corrections and margins and beautiful, legible handwriting reminding us that he'd been a school teacher before becoming an elected politician. The whole operation was geared to make him seem ubiquitous, placing the emphasis on personal and political dealings, even with those he knew casually. Staff who wrote letters for him had to be acquainted with both his distinctive writing style and his relationship with whoever had written to him. Billy Lee was in the odd position of having to pin a daily chatting note from LBJ to his mother. <laughs> The whole operation was a sleight of hand and manipulation to make people think Johnson was their sincere friend. Of course, all politicians do this to a degree, at least they try. We, we wrote parodies of, of these letters to our friends and, and then we Johnson's usual, you are my friend, my friend. <laughs> and various other corny LBJ-isms. Years later, as a congressional wife, I confess that I used some of these of uh, these uh, same deceptive <laughs> techniques. <laughs> and Bob wouldn't answer his mail. LBJ's always compassing control over his domain extended even to the point of giving his secretary a mistress who wasn't as felt as he desired fifty dollars for every pound she wants. You can talk about control free. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Roosevelt, Grace, and a few other staff members were chatting, 
at the Senator Lynn's dead senator. Senators Stuart Symington, Hubert Humphrey, and Theodore Green were milling around a fire that crackled in the fireplace and sidled up to the bar that had been set up across the room from Lynn's huge desk. Everyone grew mellow on scotch. LBJ Spaders knew just how to mix his scotch in the water. And Lyndon made his way around to introduce himself. He had large, soft brown eyes that were magnified by his high bubbles. Jiggling the chain in his pocket constantly, he asked me questions. What does your daddy do? How do you like your job? His attention was flattering, his charm and, and charisma considerable. I desperately wanted to talk to Senator Humphrey. He was my political hero at the time. Remember, I was 25 years old. <laughs> <laughs> senator Humphrey and I were engaged in conversation when suddenly the senator hollered brutally across the room, Hubert! He snapped his fingers like he was calling a dog. <laughs> <laughs> senator Humphrey bolted across the room to Lynn's side as if he had a spring in his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and my respect for information diminished a bit. <laughs> Years later, when Johnson discounted this kind of Humphrey's virtues as vice president, I remember not only Lyndon's behavior at Mrs. Roosevelt's birthday party, but also Hubert's seeming willingness to let him do it. I'm sure that there are a lot of political junkies here, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, 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 a little chapter about Congress itself, and I had so much fun writing about Congress. <laughs> Both houses of Congress are like clubs, and each has its own wives club. New members of Congress are immediately schooled in the ways of the institution and the rules of the system so that they will know how to comport themselves on the floor of the House or Senate. The long, hard road to Congress is rewarded by instant acceptance into the most elite club in the country. After enduring years of campaigning, raising money, and being a politician, you then reap the benefits of becoming a member of the U.S. Congress. Congress is made up of ordinary men with inflated egos, <laughs> whose members are constantly striving to maintain balance and avoid the inevitable egomania, which can, which can kill a political career if left unchecked. The institution itself contributes to the inflating of the egos. Elevator operators must know the members by sight. They hold the elevator for members only, while others are left waiting. Members have a private gym, it's been a group of them. They get their haircuts at a cut rate at the Capitol Farmer Shop. The television studio is provided for members to make tapes touting their accomplishments to be viewed by their constituents in their home districts in the local evenings. Along with full health insurance, they have the convenience of an on-site doctor, consulted often for ailments like the sniffles. And the Bethesda Naval Hospital is available, available for more serious health problems. Congressmen get preferential treatment from their staffs, families, and constituents the whole world, but they and their families pay a price. Members can become insulated and isolated from the realities of life and lose contact with their constituencies. <laughs> the insulation of politicians on any level of government poses a danger, a danger to the republic. <laughs> this subject has been addressed by many concerned historians. George Reed, who was President Johnson's National Press Secretary for Youth, was so concerned about the, incre the increasing insulation of our presidents that he wrote a book about it twilight of the presidency. Even less powerful and less visible congressmen can become sheltered megalomaniacs. When Bob came home in the evening acting authoritative as if he were still at the office, I would remind him that he was not the congressman at home. He was simply Bob. Congressional families can suffer from benign neglect on all sides. And when congressmen become overbearingly arrogant, it's sometimes easier for children and wives to distance themselves than to try to do it. Although members of Congress have many perks, there are definite downsides to the job. It demands long hours in and out of their offices, meeting constituents, running to the House or Senate floor to cast a vote, attending committee meetings for hours, and attending special receptions before going home in the evening. Fundraising is a constant concern in order to raise enough money to wage a campaign in the next election. Unless a member is dedicated to a healthy lifestyle. They become overweight from eating too much of the wrong food, sitting too much, and drinking too much alcohol. Bob rode his bicycle to the Capitol and rode horses from in Texas and walked a lot, which kept him in overall good shape. But on the whole, Congress is a very unhealthy place. <laughs> I won't mention the Congress. <laughs> 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 
in view of the stress and constant pace, it's little wonder that many members in the late 60s were alcoholic. There was booze everywhere. Alcoholism wasn't discussed much during that era, but people drank a lot. Bob, I said about that, was a functional, a functional alcoholic. He didn't drink until 5 p.m., but then he slugged down two or three doubles in the office and moseyed over to a reception to drink and graze at some lobbyist invitation. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> The next one is a little biz about junkets. So if you all want to hear this, uh, 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 the title is Junkets, the perk that almost makes it worth it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> junkets were arranged in conjunction with other governments to facilitate the exchange of ideas and trade among nations. Meetings and briefings were set up and arranged by the Pentagon because the level of organization required military precision. I went on a few junkets when they could afford it during the years I spent in Washington from 67 to 73 when married to Bob. The itineraries included tours to see the country and meet with heads of state and government officials which members could attend by choice. Photo ops abounded during these meetings and the publicity shots were handed to the members at the end of the trip. Members and their wives or husbands were flown in comfort on Air Force One or Two, <coughs> Delta or American's version of first class Pendleton and Paris. Eggs Benedict and a drink were placed in your hand any time you even looked like you wanted something. <laughs> Everything had been thought of, down to the last sumptuous detail. Gambling was the favorite in-flight pastime. Bob said that on one trip, a guy played poker all the way to England, got off the plane to see a horse race, and then got right back on to play, the, play poker the entire way back. <laughs> Members would sign up for a junket, fly free to the first destination, bid adios to the crew, sojourn at their leisure, and pay one-way passage back to the, to the United States. The notes I made in 1975 on a junket to Italy. August 2, 1975, 5.30 a.m. A nice, bright-eyed young man waits across the street <clears throat> with a car trunk open, eager to carry the luggage and, and deliver bodies to Andrews Air Force Base for the boarding B-137 for Rome. The car radio crackles with the voices of various bright-eyed young men that have been dispatched to other parts of the city to fetch other congressmen and their wives. Someone has evidently lost a representative named Ash. He isn't where he's supposed to be. Please spell that name over again, becomes the searching voice of whoever is in charge of delivering representative, what's his name? The VIP lounge at, at, at Andrews is appointed with smiling stewardesses at 5.30 a.m. who either, one, didn't sleep all night in order to preserve their hair dues, or two, got up at 3 a.m. to fix them. <laughs> Doilies decorate the coffee layout. In a strike with other members of the departing party, mostly a Republican group. These men and women from North Carolina and West Virginia. The men are in plaid double knit polyester suits. <laughs> Wives in either smart pants suits or suitable attire for Chamber of Commerce type meetings. Skirt, blouse, matching earrings. Everyone greets everyone else with fraternal jocularity as if they need each other's vote. <laughs> the military is marvelous. I wonder what they think of all these congressmen. They look like guys who sell insurance or shoes. <laughs> they snap to attention and really seem to enjoy their job, greeting each other with Boy Scout cliches. The legislative liaison man in charge of the group says, We don't have to do anything but enjoy ourselves. He knows how to handle all those egos. We trotted out to the plane. The official photographer takes pictures of us boarding. The plane is super comfortable. You will not encounter any glamour among this group. No Kennedy or Johnson slickness. It's sort of nice. Republicans are so middle America. <laughs> <laughs> Junkets are prime, a prime example of the special treatment afforded to our nationally elected officials. And political analysts wonder whether or not this special treatment further insulates our government officials from the reality of their constituents' lives. I think the answer is obvious.
<laughs> free wine. It was really amazing. 
and then the rain set in, and I mean, it rained for weeks, and Resurrection City turned into a quagmire. Mm. And so all these people, a lot of these people had moved out into uh, Virginia, the, the Virginia countryside, someplace where they could have put up tents. And, and so, uh, but I kept in touch with these people. They, somebody gave them, gave them some land in Alabama. And this is in my book, that they wrote me and told me how many, they were very, doing very well in Alabama. So that was kind of a happy ending. But you gotta tell the story about what? What they said to you in the tent when you went in to oh yeah to talk to them about and, and they they started quizzing you on, on your involvement in the women's movement when you had and uh, had uh, become white. Well, yes, I mean, I I've always thought I was pretty white, but this this guy they had been in Germany they 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 had a lot of places to find. We were talking one day and uh, uh, he said. Don't you know you're in number two? And I was like shocked. But I thought about that because I, I was I was being boss nigger at home, you know, and I was doing everything. And and that really resonated with me long after that. And then the women's movement just pushed me over to the to the side, you know. And that's when I started really uh, my marriage started falling apart because I just I, I didn't you know I just wasn't getting any any uh, satisfaction out of it. Doing it, uh, of, you know, helping Bob and being a silent partner. A lot of women, I'm sure, have identified with that. I was doing everything. But uh, anyway. Nadine and Sarah, would you take some questions? I think we've got some people who are eager to talk. Sure. <coughs> Alicia Perez, and uh, Sarah's my boss, but I'll go ahead and ask a question. <laughs> um, I wanted uh, to know a little bit more about uh, Lady Bird during that time. Uh, Lady Bird was born, I guess, 15 or 16. You were born in the 30s? Uh, I was born in 31. 31. Um, a little bit of an age difference. Um, what can you tell us about about her and you and the role she played? And clearly, she followed that that mold, and you did, did not. What were the differences? Uh, Lady Bird, Lady Bird worked constantly. Uh, she she and Linda uh, kind of. I mean, I, I kind of, you know I really kind of uh, I learned so much from Lady Bird. And she and she was uh, she was really a, a wonderful wife to him in spite of his um, oh uh, he, he didn't he would humiliate Lady Bird he was really really bad about no, he was not a really uh, wonderful husband but I'll tell you what, the thing is I but she was and also then see I related to her when when. when and a majority leader, and then uh, in later years, back in the in 1967, she was first lady, and she was an absolutely superb first lady. She did everything right, and uh, I've always wondered about Lady Bird why she put up with this woman because he was so so he was just so was so rude to her. And then I read Jan Jarbo Russell's. Uh, biography of Lady Bird, which really made things clear to me, because her father had been an abusive husband, and uh, he, 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 his wife was miserable. She finally died, and Lady Bird, uh, Lady Bird, her mother, the role model she had, was one who hung in with an abusive husband, and and, and so until she finally died. And uh, Lady Bird did the same thing. She hung in with Linda. But what was so, you know, when she, when he, he died early, he died in 64. And Lady Bird inherited all, all the goodwill, the money, the, the love from the country. And so that's, you know, I, it's like karma. She had wonderful karma. And so she, and she was this long, long life and everyone loved her. And, and Lennon died in the 60s, 
while the spring. So that that combination is, is really is a winner. My mom's the campaigner. My dad was up just the policy walk. He couldn't campaign with beans. And when I was a kid, we would be at cocktail parties, and they would stand back to back. And my dad would be standing there pontificating about some arcane <laughs> area of the law that reaches back to Roman times. <laughs> and my mother would be standing just, you know, literally back to back, leaning over his shoulder, saying, you need to talk to that person over there. <laughs> that one over there is a lobbyist, but he's a former congressman, you know, former legislator from Arkansas, and we would speak with him. And that woman over there, you definitely need to talk to her. She used to be the, the uh, chief of staff for so and so. She's having an affair with so and so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it was just incredible to watch. And then he, you know, he leaned back over and said, This man is approaching me, and I can't recall what his name is. Shadows of real people. 
and they have a you know they have a marketing scheme, but a character like I, I, I think of the think of the contrast between Bob Bullock and David Dewhurst. However you come down on that, you know Bullock could never be elected now. He had you know five divorces. He ran around with women. He drank excessively. He took a state plane to Las Vegas. I mean those kind of things the the public quote unquote would never put up with today. But he was. In my humble opinion, a far better visionary lieutenant governor of Texas than David Dewhurst has proven. <laughs> so, without having to get into that issue specifically, hasn't there been a, a change in the way we look at our politicians and choose them? Well, sure, Republicans are in power now. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, in the but, state. Right. But, but on the other hand, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of blow dried, prefabricated, pretty cardboard. <laughs> Democrats out there too. I mean, what happened to all those real characters, and have we lost something in our politics because it's harder to elect those kind of people now? Well, I'll tell you what, these the educational system is letting the kids down because we don't get ethics, we don't get civics, we don't get the kids don't get educated about <coughs> our government, local, state, or national. They don't, and all they do, all they see on TV is, is all that stuff on TV. We need to start educating our children about their government. They, they, they have no idea uh, how to get to it. You know, I mean, we used to be able to go uh, talk, to, talk to our government ourselves, but we can't do that anymore. I think that depends on the school. My grandchildren are, uh, are going to public school and private school, and they get wonderful courses. I've been grandparents to grandparents today the last, uh, the last week, the last several years. And I, I think they, they, the school my grandkids are going to, they are getting wonderful. I think there's a couple of things that work here, though. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, teaching civics and whatnot. But I also see two other two other things at play here that are, I mean, that's bubbling up from the from the bottom up. But I see two things bubbling down to the top, too, that are creating this blow-dry type thing. One, most people get all or most of their political information. TV, and that's new. That's one one thing. Um, so it is to a politician's advantage to have a good TV head and be able to speak in, in very short clips that are relatively unsubstantive. But then there's a second movement over the last. Uh, it's been you know almost 30 years now, starting in the starting in the 80s, to devolve government back down to the locals to the point where you get such an extruded and complicated process that people really don't know where to go get their information any longer. There are so many different commissions and boards and divisions, and uh, uh, it's become very difficult. You go and talk to your elected official, I and mean, I get it all the time. People come and say, "Can't you do something about blah blah blah?" <laughs> honest response has to be, well, actually, my office doesn't do that. This office over here does that. And I know it's really frustrating for you uh, that I have no authority over this, <laughs> and that I have to send you over to um, the TCEQ, for instance, to, to handle this, because I, I, I am not providing the authority. I did have it at one time, but now it's with this agency over here. So I think it is really difficult for people to understand how government works. I think it's that is, in some regard, in, in some measure, um, there are some issues where it is to a politician's advantage to obfuscate the process. You see, in transportation policy, for instance, you can't go to a state legislator and say, what are, what are you going to do about my roads? <laughs> They'll just send you to an agency, one of several. <laughs> Um, it makes it very difficult to hold anybody accountable, <coughs> and it makes it very easy for the politician to just look low dry and cardboard. Sarah, uh, I was uh, working in college, I worked in legislature, and your dad was in the legislature at that time. And uh, I, uh, I like that you cutting up about some of his, his speech and some of his uh, uh, acts and so forth. Tell us what you think about your dad. I, I just want to tell you that I watched him in the Texas legislature, and uh, in those days it was pretty much a conservative, we call it those days a conservative Democrat. And, and your dad was on the Ralph Gardner side, uh, more or less. But he his big white, his white suits and so forth. He was he was quite an imposing figure. And so well, I, I, I like to hear from your side and not from the next wife's side. Well, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, this is, well, here's an example of just what we're talking about, though, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, you know, how do people access governments any longer? What What is their conduit if not their elected official? And one thing that was different about my dad and was special about my dad is unlike today when you go to a house member and say, I've got an issue and I want you to address it, they say, oh, well, let me get with ledge council and see what they come up with. And uh, If you went to my dad and said, I have an issue and can you fix it, he'd crack open the book right in front of you and say, give me a pen. <laughs> and some rubber cement, and I'm going to write something on here and interlineate it right here. <laughs> and I'm going to go to the back of the mic, and I know that there's a bill to which this is germane that I'm certain I could stick something into from the back mic when it comes up on the floor. And he would do that like that, and you would get representation. <laughs> but now it's like, oh, well, hand ring, hand ring. I'm going to have to check with the agency, and I'm going to have to go over to ledge council, and gosh, gee whiz, I wouldn't know how to draft a piece of legislation if I had to it on it. And now it's really rather frustrating. But I think he was unusual in that respect. I don't think it's every day that you have a politician that's also a practitioner that knows actually how to build law. There's very few of them out there that know how to build law. They know how to look good, they know how to talk good, and they know how to get by. But in terms of building a piece of law that's going to stand the test of time and do what your constituent intended it to do, and be good policy on top of that, hey, how about that? Something that your constituent wants and is good policy? Um, that's, that's an unusual politician. I have a question for you, Sarah, but before it's very interesting, the man I'm from, you mentioned the lack of characters these days. I had that conversation with a friend of mine about two months ago where he was lamenting the fact that there aren't any real characters in politics these days, and so it's interesting to hear that. Going back to the kids, <clears throat> your kids, what did you take from your childhood being the daughter of a politician and now you being a politician how do you deal with your kids um, relative to that? Well, I'm the daughter of two politicians, <laughs> first off. And when I take that, I mean, my, I mean, my mom is my toughest critic and my best ally. She gave me a copy of a, a, a very difficult letter that she had, um, she had written a difficult letter to my dad and he had written a difficult letter back to her about having uh, neglected their relationship and neglected the family uh, in service of what he mistakenly thought was a, a larger calling. And um, that's that's something to think about always. When you're an elective when you're in an elective position, um, just as my mom said in the in her piece in the portion of the book about Congress. Um, there's so many, there's so much message out there for a politician to convince the politician that whatever they're doing is the most important thing on the face of the planet. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's damaging psychologically. And it, it can be very uh, um, alienating both for the politician and for the politician's family. And that's, you know, you can't blame yeah, you can't blame constituents. That's that's a, a test of a person's character. It's it's not done to a person. It's it's the you know um, it's just the test of the character. We have time for one more question. One more question for. Um, okay. Yeah, draw straws. <laughs> I had totally forgotten that I once had a discussion with Congressman Eckhart about the ERA. <laughs> and he said, I mean, this is not a question, I'm sorry, but do you recall that he was not for the ERA? Yeah, I, uh, there's a there's a wonderful photograph that my stepbrother took of him as his third wife was just pitching him out for having voted against the extension the, the, the extension of the ratification period of the ERA, and that that's a that's a uh, he was for the ERA. And here, this was his 
This was his explanation, not mine. He was just me. reporting it out. He said that he was 100% in favor of the ERA, that there was a set time period for the states to ratify it. When the states failed to, to be able to pull off the ratification in the, in the uh, stated time frame, he um, uh, presumed that that meant that the nation was not ready for the ERA and that he was therefore not going to vote to extend the ratification period. I guess I spoke to him before that, and he said that he felt that it was already inherent in the Constitution that women were equal. He, he had also said that. Here's, here's the deal. My dad was a total patrician. He was born in 1913. He said at one point that he hired women, uh, mostly women in his office because that he'd get better brains cheaper. <laughs> uh, he was married three times. On his third divorce, I asked him, you know, whether he's going to marry again. He said, oh, I think that marriage is a social construct. It's probably outlived its usefulness. <laughs> so, you know, he did have, he was a lover of women. He was a lover of very strong women. And he, uh, but, but he, he did have some kind of weird ideas about females generally. He also thought, he, he thought that, uh, um, Reproductive rights was a turnstile issue. I had many arguments with him about that. So, uh, um, the, 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 uh, oftentimes, I consider myself a feminist. My mom raised a feminist. My mom raised somebody who would uh, um, uh, try on boxes to see if they fit, and if they did, kick them to the side and don't worry about what comes next. Something else good will come. Um, and uh, this is still a man's world. And I don't claim men that it's still a man's world. It mm -hmm. is. And uh, it's a little bit harder for us. And I'm not saying that to be a victim or anything. I'm just saying it for what it is. Could you expand on that further? What is, what's it going to take for women to survive? To just recognize it and don't wallow around in it, just get the job done. Be the best, you know, best politician that you can be. I mean, I, I'm the daughter of two politicians, and what I took from my dad is learn to build a better mousetrap, and you better, by God, know how the springs work. And don't give it to somebody else to figure it out. You figure out how the thing works. And what I learned from my mom is. While you're figuring out how the springs work, you may better make goddamn sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and not just to feed your ego. And that it better really be for the folks. And if you can't step away from it, then you're a junkie and you need to fess up. Very nice. <laughs>